Right, someone's done an experiment on egg hardness. This is a very odd experiment because like, how do you measure how hard an egg is? So they have some kind of strange units which measure how hard an egg is. I don't know. Okay, does that work? Yes, it does. The term thank goodness for that comes to mind because otherwise I I would be very annoyed. Right. We'll do it with the other system and I will wonder why on earth my microphones aren't charged. Got two of them and both of them are flat as a pancake. And there I was looking for a charging cable and it's in front of my nose in the pack in the empty box. OK, let's get back to what I was supposed to be doing, which is egg hardness. So here I've got some egg hardness data. So the egg hardness has two things. It has the hardness of the egg in some kind of unit, which is I don't know what. And you have the amount of food you've given to the chicken. So what you want to do is examine the relationship between the two of them. If I go to graphs and I go to chart builder, uh, don't show this dialogue again. It's fine. I've set up my data correctly, so I know what I'm doing. Now, the standard way you do one of these analyses, if you were doing it in Excel, is you'd plot a graph. Now, which variable goes along which axis this is the first thing that we have to decide so in some of my questions i do it the wrong way round okay so food goes along the x-axis does everyone agree hardness in y why is that true or why do you think that's true Oh. 
why do you think that food goes along the x-axis and y and hardness goes on the y-axis yes so i don't like this dependent and independent thing because it's confusing because you would think that the independent thing is the thing that you have no control over at all but it isn't the independent thing is the thing that you actually regulate so in this case it's the amount of food you're giving to the chicken so that is the treatment variable the thing that is part of the experimental variable the thing that you are in control of and changing so food goes along the x-axis now, that is your first decision and you must get it right. It's really important to figure out the correct one in the X and Y axis. There are some cases where it's not obvious. So if I am doing a comparison between arm length, so the arm length between here and here happens to be related to the size of my feet. So which of the two should go in the x-axis, my feet, my foot length, or the length from my wrist to the inside of my elbow? In that case, there is no dependent and independent variable. You could use them either way around, exactly, except if you have them one way around or the other way around, the equation for the line will be different. So if you switch X and Y, the equation changes. They are associated to each other, and there's a very strong association, but you can't tell which direction the association goes in. This case you can, and in most cases you can. In some cases, there is a change between the two. Take, for example, when you were doing DNA ladders on gels. So you have some set fragment sizes of DNA. And then you see how far they migrate along the gel when you run the current through it for a certain amount of time. So when you first plot the graph, you would put the size of your ladder along X and the distance it moves along Y. But when you actually come to use that uh, graph to predict the size of an unknown piece of DNA, you'd use it the other way around. You'd use it so the distance that it goes along the gel is on the x-axis and the size of the fragment is on the y-axis. So this is why standard curves are an important part of this process and you move between the two. So it is usual to have the distance traveled along X and the size on Y, regardless of which way around you're doing the experiment. Right, so we've got that. So egg hardness goes in the Y axis. So press OK. And hopefully there's a graph. This is the standard scatter graph. You would then like in Excel, you can double click on it and you can go along these things at the top until you find something that says add a fit line or add an interpolation line. Uh, I don't want to do an interpolation. I want to do a fit line. Oh, can I switch off an interpolation? I don't want that straight. No, just oh, I don't want to delete those. Problem with interpolations is once they're on, they're a bit difficult to get rid of in SPSS. It's an annoyance. Uh, I have to select it and then delete it. So I don't want to do an interpolation because that just joins the dots, which is not what I want. I want to do a line of fit. Right. So close. So what I should have gone to do is do fit at total. So the line fit at total is in there. And I want to do it being linear. I want to do a straight line fit, apply. And it's put a load more things in as usual. 
Is that other fit line? Right, I've got my line there and I've got it twice now. Let's delete one of them. Done. So that's what you would get when you were doing it in Excel. You'd plot your scatter plot of your X and Y. You get the equation, which is Y equals minus 2.32 plus 0.48 times whatever X is. So in this case, 0.48 times food. You've got the R squared, which is 0.987, so it's a very strong uh, association between the two. The R, which is the correlation, will be the square root of that, so it's going to be about 0.99. It's very high. There's a very strong relationship between the amount of food you give and the hardness of the A. One thing that Excel does better than uh, SPSS in that case is, so if you look at this graph, it goes beyond the largest value of X and the smallest value of X that you have in your uh, set of data. So you're extending this line into a region that you haven't collected data from. You should not do that. You should, only draw the line between the smallest value of x and the largest value of x because outside that region you haven't tested and the shape could change outside that region right so that's your bog standard excel way of doing it based on doing a graph now that's fine if you've got something nice and easy like this particular set of data it looks a good fit to the line. I wish I could move that equation off. Um, it's a, a pretty good fit to the line. Everything looks great. But really, you want to do some diagnostics just to make sure that it's behaving itself. So the first thing that would be nice uh, on the fit line is I can put confidence intervals on it. So I can do confidence intervals for the mean value and apply them. So this is telling me that although this is the exact straight line, if I was to predict a value for a f amount of food, which is 15, so usually you'd go to 15, then go up until you find the line and then read across on the y-axis to find out what the value is. But now, because I've got confidence intervals, instead of making an estimate of an exact number, I can say it's between this number and this number. So I can give a confidence interval for my calculated values. So that's a bit more sophisticated than you can do in Excel. Excel actually has a new predict function, which will do those sort of error calculations. But SPSS can do a more detailed version of regression, which is what we're going to do now. So I'm going to go to Analyze. I'm going to go down to Regression, and it is a linear regression. It's a linear regression which only has two variables, so it's not a multivariate uh, regression. Uh, there's nothing complicated like logistic regressions, which are horrible. It's nice and simple. So let's go for a linear regression. Now, when you open linear regression, you're starting to do this process, which is which I talked about, which is a linear model. Which means that you can try out lots of different things if your data is particularly complicated. So what we can do in this data set is because there's only two variables, we don't have to worry. But maybe you had two different breeds of chicken. So you had another variable here, which is categorical. So you could use that to select fitting a line of slope for each of the different variables. So you could use selection to create two different lines on your page. For the simple case, again, we have the dependent variable. Oops, that's the wrong way around dependent variable, which is hardness, and we have the independent variable, which is food. Okay. 
you can set it up if you had more variables to do different lines of regression at the same time. So that's what this next button means. I've set up one model. If I want to set up loads of other models, I can do them all at the same time. And you have this thing called a method called enter. Now, if I've got lots and lots of variables, so I'm doing multivariate analysis, what I can do is I can either put all the variables in at one go, or I can stepwise add them one at a time, starting from the top and then going down to the bottom. I can start with all of them and remove them one at a time. Or I can do, I can't remember what the backward and forward process is. In general, we'll stick with enter. And I've only got one variable, so it doesn't really matter which way I do it. Next thing I've got is statistics. Now I'm going to click on this because I want to calculate the confidence intervals for the slope, for the gradient, and for the intercept. So I'm going to cal calculate those at the 95% level. I can do these other things as well, but I don't think I will. I just want that for now. Continue. I'm not going to do any plots. The standard way of running SPSS is not to see the graph and the slope of the line going through. So the graph that I've shown you already is not a typical way of using SPSS. Uh, save. OK, so save, I need to do a bit of explanation. on. So when you do this regression, there are diagnostics that you can do as well. Now, this is the main reason why you should use SPSS and not use Excel. Fitting the line is simple, but sometimes you fit a line and it's not very good. So you just don't need to worry about the methods. So in terms of the method, I don't click. So next allows you to create another separate model. This tells you the enter and whatever tells you what how to build the current model. Right, so we'll go to the save button. Now, save. You really want to do diagnostics on regression. You can't do this in Excel. So this is why you need to use SPSS. What you can do is take each of the measured values of your independent variable, calculate the line of best fit, and then calculate the predicted values for each of those values of X, and compare them to the actual values that you measured when you did the experiment. So this is called the unstandardized predicted value. You can also calculate something called a standardized predicted value, which changes it to having a default slope of one and a default intercept of zero. We don't want to do that because it's just difficult to compare to the original set of data, so it makes no sense. The other thing you can, other things you can do is calculate the residuals. So the residual is the difference between the calculated predicted value and the actual value you measured. So again, you can do these unstandardized, or you can standardize them so that they have a mean difference of zero and a standard deviation of one. I'm going to calculate both of them because when I come to plot them later, it's useful to have them in a uh, standardized form because it's easier to look at the graph. There are some other things you can calculate which are called distances. So distances tell you about the effect each point of data on the slope of the line. So if you have an outlier, it can substantially change the slope of the line. You can measure this by Marlinobis distance, which I don't usually do, by Cook's distance, and the one that I like most is leverage. So if you imagine that the straight line that you fit through your data is like a seesaw. So you have a balancing point in the center. Now, that is the mean value 
for your x's and y's and they rotate the, the line the slope of it depends on moving about that point the mean value of x and mean value of y now if i have a, a point which is a big outlier it pulls the slope up or pushes it down much more than it should be so that's the process of leverage your that data point is pulling or uh, pulling it up or pushing it down so it either increases or decreases uh, or it increases the slope either positively or negatively <clears throat> more than it should do <coughs> so we calculate all those things and i go continue let's forget the rest so i press ok So SPSS has done its business. So the first thing it does is it gives you a table which tells you what your model is. So it tells you what are the independent variables. In this case, there's only one which is called food and it was put in by the method called enter. Next thing it does is summarize the model in terms of Pearson's correlation, which is R and the R squared. So R squared is called the coefficient of determination, and it tells you how much of the variability of Y is explained by the variability of X. So in this case, it's 98.7%. That's what this R squared is telling you. So that means almost all of that eggshell hardness is determined by how much food supplement the chickens are eating. The next thing below this is the ta the ANOVA table. We'll come to ANOVA in three weeks time. It's not particularly important that you look at this now. Uh, the only thing that matters is this thing in the SIG column. So that means the significance of your model. If that value is below 0 0.05, your model is significant. So the line fits the data and it's not noisily scattered absolutely everywhere. It means it's credible to put a line through your data. So you need that to be less than 0 0.05. Here it's a lot less than 0 0.05. So that's good. Then finally, you come to the actual thing that you care about. So this is the table that you need to understand and that everybody gets wrong. And I sit there going, why? It's just not rocket science. You have a table. It has two rows in it. One is called the constant. One is called food. So the constant is the intercept of your line. It's the number that you add to every point to get the equation of your line. And in this case, it says it's minus 2.32. Then you have something which is related to food. So food is your independent variable. So the slope of the line is how much y, so in this case, the hardness of the egg, depends on food. What is the slope of the line? What is the coefficient that goes in front of the x variable? So that's 0.4a1. So if I go back to this equation, it says, y equals minus 2.32 plus 0.48 times x. So that's exactly what that model is telling you. It's minus 2.320 plus 0.481 times food. That is it. That's the constant, that's the gradient. Not rocket science, not difficult. It's amazing how many students get that wrong. Next thing you can go along and here you've got this calculated significance of your model. Here you've got a calculated significance for the constant and for the food. So it can be calculated uh, for each of the variables in your model. And it says both of them are significant. It does something called a t-test. Don't worry about how it's done. It's not particularly important. What is important is this next bit, which is the confidence interval for these coefficients. So 
This one's your constant, your intercept. This one is your gradient. So it says that the intercept, although the line through the middle of the confidence intervals is minus 2.320 plus 0.481x, or 0.481 times food, in reality, it could be anywhere between minus 2.786 and minus 1.854. That's the constant is somewhere in that range. And the slope is somewhere between 0.444 and 0.517. So that's not just one slope. There's a variability of slope between those two values, the average of which is 0.481. So when you're reporting a model and a fit of your line, you should actually report these confidence intervals of the gradient. Not so much the intercept, because the intercept, particularly in this case, makes no sense, which is quite lucky that SPSS has drawn this chart as it has. If I took that down and extended it, I'd get an intercept where I have zero food and it would be minus 2.85, uh, 2.85 is it? No, 2.32 units of egg hardness. But what would that mean? An egg hardness below zero is meaningless. It's a spontaneously exploding egg. And a chicken that's not having any food whatsoever is not making any eggs and is going to die. A lot of the time, the constant is irrelevant. The thing that really matters is the slope. Below that is something called the residual statistics. So this tells you about how badly or how well your uh, model fits to the data. So the predicted values, the best one of them has a difference of one, uh, sorry, the minimum difference is one, the maximum difference is 7.5, the average difference is 3.63. Uh, for the predicted values, sorry, of the hardness. That's their total values, not the difference. Um, the standardized predicted values ignore those. The thing that you're looking at is residual. So the residual difference, so the difference for each of the predicted values against each of the real values, varies between minus 0 0.303 to 0 0.333, and it has a mean of zero. The way line fits work, the difference in the residual should always be zero because that's how the model works. The standard deviation for those differences is 0.196. Now the minimum and maximum are 0 0.303 and 0.338, which is less than two standard deviations. So this suggests that all of the data points within that data set are quite reasonable. The leverage similarly has a very small standard deviation. Minimum value is zero. The maximum value is 0.323, which is a, a lot bigger than two standard deviations of this. But we'll do some plots to show what I mean. So let's do a graph. Oh, actually, let's do another thing first. So let's look at the data. So when I started doing the data, I only had two columns, food and egg hardness. Now I've got food, egg hardness, pre-1, which is the predicted value, res-1, which is the res uh, residual between the predicted and the actual measured hardness. So this is the predicted hardness for a value of food of 19.5. The actual was 7.1, the predicted is 7.85, so the difference between the two is 0 uh, 0 0.048. If I standardize this, to having a mean of uh, zero and a, stand, a standard deviation of one, it becomes 0.243. The Cook's distance and the leverage of these particular things. Don't worry about them for a second. Let's do some graphs. So I can do a graph. So I've got my scatter plots. I've got food at the bottom. I want to take out the egg hardness and put in the unstandardized residuals to start with. Press OK. 
So when I'm looking at this, I want to see no pattern in it whatsoever. I want to see things randomly above and below, and it doesn't, then should be no shape in it whatsoever. If I've got a curve, so sometimes they get a residual with a curve like this, and that there won't be lines scattered randomly, then a line is not a good fit. It's actually curved data. In this case, it's randomly everywhere, but I can't instantly looking at it tell if I've gone. I've got any outliers which have unusual residuals because I don't know what the standard deviation is. I mean, I do know what the standard deviation is because it's in that other table. I know that the standard deviation of the residuals is, whoops, if I go back to here, standard deviation is 0.196. So that'll be about here. So two standard deviations would be four. So all of these are within two standard deviations. But if I plotted instead the unstandardized one, the standardized residual, I press OK, this one tells me how many standard deviations I am away, so I can see that everything falls within two standard deviations. So there are no outliers in my data set. They're also scattered randomly, so the residuals plot tells me that my uh, analysis is correct, and my line is good fit. Everything's happy about that. Next, the other graph I can do is the Cook's distance, which is difficult to see anything in, but better is centralized, centered leverage. That's okay. Now, centered leverage will always look like this. So the points that are in the middle, near to the mean value of x and y, have less influence about how the seesaw moves. If I put on a weight close to the, the middle of the seesaw, of the balance, it doesn't make any difference. The further away something is, when you put it, if I put a small weight on a long way away from the middle of the seesaw, it has more effect. So that's the process of leverage. Now here, I can see from the table of data, if I go back to it, that uh, the standard deviation of leverage is 0 0.097. So two times 0 0.097, well, let's say it was 0 0.1. So two times 0 0.1 would be 0 0.2. So all of these values of leverage below this line of 0 0.2, these are all fine, exactly what I'd expect. But here, this value of the food that's at 19.5 is making a very large contribution to the slope of the line. So if I go back to looking at the line itself, if this data point wasn't here, then the slope would be much more, dif uh, much more difficult to define. So it could go up more in this angle because of these ones that are below could be lower because these ones are below, it could be higher because those ones are above. It just might change the slope of the line. So if you have something like that, you begin to query it and you have to decide, is it a good fit or isn't it? In this case, I think it's fine because the residuals are all fine. But if you had something bad in the residuals beyond two standard deviations, then you'd have to build the model with that data in and then build the model with the data taken out and just compare the slope of the lines between the two. Just to know that that potentially bad point of data isn't affecting your uh, understanding of the relationship completely. You can't do that in Excel. And you should be doing it all the time. You will notice that most people who do these kind of analyses don't do it because they're all rubbish at stats. It's just bad practice not to do it. OK, so I'm going to take a break there because I've gone through lots of detail of that particular model. 
and I'm going to stop my recording. Uh,